Okay, it's a lecture that includes some monsters as well as some miniatures. And the uh, really it can, involves two of the potentials that you, we feel all the time. Uh, the gravitational potential, so we're sitting here, uh, not floating into the air, is the one that really I want to talk about. And I call it the sophomore physics Earth. Uh, it is an averaging and a very, um, shall we say, idealized uh, picture of uh, the uh, gravitational Earth outside and inside. And these are the, uh, the two highest symmetry um, force fields, potentials, whatever you want to, to call. And as a result, they're the ones that you can actually uh, study the orbits analytically. And uh, it is uh, pretty much a mathematical truth that if you don't have symmetry in whatever you're doing, you probably won't be able to do anything analytically with it. Of course, we have computers to take over at that point, but it sure is nice to be able to do things and talk about the uh, geometry and the mathematical structure. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to compare while we're doing these two uh, the electrostatic and the gravity. And today's the first time we really get into the units, MKS units, of both of these. Uh, that are all going to come up later in the course, but it's nice to see some of the things in a little bit of a different way than you might have learned them in your um, undergraduate and early graduate uh, courses. And then I'm going to go for the monsters and make the monsters miniature and so forth. I'm going to imagine a crushed Earth. We're going to crush the Earth all the way down to make a neutron matter, and we're going to imagine going one step further. It's a big step, and that's the one that gives you black holes. So we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, there are a lot of formulas and things that I'm going to review. There's going to be a very, I should say, um, sleep-inducing part of this lecture as we go through the formulas that uh, go with the geometry. But um, these are uh, the best I could do to put all of those formulas onto the geometry, and it's something you'll have to come back and study on your own. Uh, when we need it. And I'll be giving a few problems before we get... Now, I, I, I warn you that this is done because this particular course is structured so that the, the uh, orbital uh, chapter, that's um, the, <clears throat> the chapter 5, uh, comes fairly late in the course. And uh, the things that go with that are 6 and 7 rotations, and then um, uh, a certain kind of orbital structure in uh, in uh, unit seven. So a lot of the stuff that's really technical here is being done now to prepare for uh, that later uh, um, study. So um, let's go ahead. Um, as I said, we're talking about monsters, and one of the monsters we we've just had to go through is a hurricane that really devastated uh, the boat. The Bahamas, and um, that's really what, the worst I've ever seen in this hemisphere. Go to the other hemispheres, and the typhoons have done a damage uh, that's equivalent to that. Um, we're going to be talking about the Coriolis effect that makes these uh, monsters uh, a little bit today, but mostly uh, later on. We're setting the stage for that here. Anyway, uh, here are the various. Uh, things that uh, you can click on when you're looking at the lecture on the computer and uh, get to those uh, that's stuff in the, um, that's of interest. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, from time to time uh, using some of them. So uh, let's take a look at uh, something that's really simple and that is the geometric series. The um, basic idea of it is very simple. It's just take a number and square it and cube it and fourth power it, or go the other way with roots. Uh, so I'd like to show you uh, that being done in a geometrical way, and uh, we may get some problems that uh, I do deal with this uh, later on. Let me get ahead on this uh, computer right here. Um, basic idea is here, pick a number. I picked uh, 1.5 as a scale factor. Um, 
that would multiply x to give y, and that would be the equation of this line right here. Uh, S can stand for scale factor or else slope. The slope of the line is 1.5. Pretty simple. Okay. So I draw that line on a piece of graph paper, and the graph paper lets me make some uh, make a curve uh, with it. Off of and the 45 degree line, as you know, is important in practically all the geometry we've done so far. The 45 degree line was the center of momentum on the velocity plots. So anyway, uh, we go ahead here uh, one step at a time. Okay, and that's the, the sort of, as I say, the zig and the zag is what we're going to be using in this geometry that we talk about for a little while here. Um, as I uh, take uh, each of these back and forth zigzags, I find uh, in the process of doing that uh, higher and higher powers, that is products, of this scale factor, this slope. Okay, so that, that's kind of neat. Um, up it goes. But of course, it could go the other way too. And the zig and the zag could back and forth. Here we're talking about minus one power, minus two power, minus three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And at about that time, I'm kind of out I'm into the pixel region here. Do any more and it's it's just a, it would be a, a blob right in here. Everything from, say, minus 6 to infinity is right in here. So this, you know, this is a, a feeling you should get for geometrical series. They really get crazy as you go in the inverse. Okay? So, there's a zigzag, a, a very simple zigzag, which we're going to be uh, using uh, for a, a number of uh, purposes here. Okay, so let me uh, go ahead and put this one up here. And the next step here is to check off uh, reading the integer uh, values of the abscissa. That's my check, first check mark right there. But as I go uh, to the next check mark, okay, make a little uh, check there. I'm going to put a point there. Then I go to, uh, up, up, zig up to here and do it again and then again. Okay, so just to, to get the idea, I will make a curve. Uh, that's what will have. I'll have a curve with certain points. I, I don't have anything going right now to get in between those points, but if you double the zags, basically, you can, get, you can make the thing more precise. Now, it goes the other way as well. As I go to the minus ones, or zero, s to the zero, whatever the scale factor is, is finite, uh, is one. So there's a point on this uh, curve. And then minus one and minus two. So you see uh, all the, the very funny zigzags, they make the curve go out to the left. All right, so what we've basically done here is create a very simple geometrical construction for an exponential of a certain base. This time it's 1.5. So that's y equal 1.5 to the x power uh, that we've uh, just drawn there in a very clever way. And then all I have to do is reflect through the 45 degree line and you've produced the logarithm. That is y equal to log base s, scale factor of x. So there you go. These are some very important functions for physics. Virtually everything that we do in physics, looked at at the extremes, involves exponentials or logarithms, depending on how you're viewing it. So, this is, uh, you know, and all of this stuff is stuff that you should take. You may feel, oh, guys, this is just trivial. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. But you, you're going to be teaching somebody someday, and these things are helpful. You see, they let you visualize and <coughs> let you use that part of your brain that is uh, non-algebraic sometimes. And then marry the two. That's the important thing. Now, of course, this is the history. This is really the history that uh, our civilization uh, to travel to different places used. Um, first of all, the, the uh, Greeks, uh, I should say, Athales, the Turks, but uh, the Turks, Greeks kind of lived in the same neighborhood for a long time. 
along with the Egyptians. Uh, the, the idea of ruler and compass was very much a cool thing. Um, and then the navigators. The navigators needed a, a parallel rule to mark things on a chart, so that's the next toolbox. All this stuff was in the preface you've probably read. Uh, well, I hope you've read already. And then analytic geometry comes along, where you have extra coordinates, such as what we're using here. We wouldn't be able to live without this. And that was not available uh, so much for somebody like Newton. You couldn't just go down to the store and buy graph paper. You couldn't push a button on a computer and have it print graph paper. Uh, that's a luxury that we have, and we should treasure that. Okay, but now we're going a little bit further here, the real toolboxes, these things. Okay, and so we're, we're going to make use of that uh, uh, plenty. Everything, everything that you can put your hands on that helps you do something, you should take advantage of. Now compare this uh, little thing here with 1.5 as the base, and the one that we really will be interested in in uh, chapter 10 of the review unit, where we get uh, to going and explain the exponential and everyone knows about. Now, this thing is really steep compared to that one, uh, and uh, this settles down immediately to the pixel size uh, on a graph of this particular size. So. That, and the fact that this number is really strange. I, how many of you have marveled at the fact that it goes 2.7, 1A, 2A? You figure that's okay. But then it's 1A, 2A again. And is it 1A, 2A again? No, no, it isn't. It's not a repeating decimal. It's not rational. But it looks rational for a long time. And it has all kinds of weird properties that are quasi-rational. So we're going to be talking about that stuff uh, as well, because it, it uh, figures in physics as well, and it's particularly in group theory and things like that. Now here is a use of this um, uh, sequence, the, the sequence that was really important for our culture. And this is something where the Western culture seems to have done something that none of the others did. Everybody had art, and they're trying to do pictures of things. Uh, in China, you name it, uh, any of a culture had pictures, but it was only in the West that they conceived of the idea of perspective, of having a depth to a drawing, not just having it flat, to have it you know, go off into the, into the distance, into the painting, so to speak. And this is a picture with a vanishing point, just with a single a vanishing point that architects um, need to learn about, but th th this is just where we look at all of the different fractions of a scale factor. In this case, I'm taking the scale factor pretty steeply, but one half, the inverse of that, is also a fair game, and so is 1.5. You name it, it makes a different drawing, slightly different drawing, but everything would have perspective for any particular scale. And the way I like to say the uh, <clears throat> To, to, to name this uh, drawing uh, is when you went to school, okay, on the first day of school, as a perspective, the perspective that you would have as a first grader, is just a little guy, this is big hallway, right? But if you bring a scale factor up to about, a, or down to about a half, in the notation we're using here, this is more like with the 12th grader, just at graduation. He's walking down the hall, a very tall person. He sees the same hallway uh, uh, differently. Okay? So that's a thing to think about. Now we're going to be looking at trajectories that are actually in four dimensions, and the perspective drawing that your head does with that is really interesting. This is the oscillator that we're going to be working with after we've uh, defined the oscillator potential and all that kind of stuff. So um, I get you ready for, for that. Um, <clears throat> in this thing. Now, the two, as I said, the two um, force fields that we're working with here are a potential r squared over 2 that we've uh, already uh, mentioned. Uh, <coughs> we've uh, had a force field that goes with that. That's just the oscillator uh, um, force field. And uh, this r to the first power. But then there's this other one that's r to the minus first power with a, that's a potential, and then the force field itself is inverse r squared. So r squared, uh, inverse r squared here, but that's the potential fighting with the force field, and then the force field here with the inverse, 1 over r. So those are the two 
um, potentials that have this enormous symmetry that's beyond the spherical symmetry that we're used to. Okay, the uh, Coulomb field has an O4 symmetry, and then the oscillator potential has a unitary, a unitary two or three or four, whatever number of dimensions your oscillator has. Uh, that's the symmetry uh, that it uh, lets you do your analysis, have your creation destruction operators, have your all this fancy calculus uh, that makes it possible to analyze the thing analytically. Okay, change those exponents even slightly, and it's not analyzable. Okay, you have to take a computer to it. Okay, now the zigzag that I've been talking about uh, for the uh, for that. Um, Let's uh, just go ahead here uh, a, a bit. Uh, what I'll do is um, let both these screens be active today. And the idea is how do you uh, draw a parabolic point with just one zigzag? Okay, pick a, pick a point. So uh, the basic idea in this recipe is you pick whatever x you're interested in. Say, I want to find out where the parabola is. Uh, at that particular uh, point there, and I'm talking about just y equal x squared. Okay. And so what you do is the first thing you zig uh, here uh, to its y equal x and intersection to the x and y and come back to here. And then you zag to the origin. That's zag to the origin. Then you just extend it back to the uh, x equal 1 line. Okay. So that's the first point on a parabola right there. And I'm just showing where the parabola is, all of its points uh, right there. And that's the one that you got for this particular value of the x. Okay. So the logic of that is that you're just looking for a question mark times question mark, the scale uh, squared, uh, the first uh, term in a geometric uh, uh, expansion. So that is uh, what's going on here. So just once again, uh, pick a, I want to find out what it is at minus 2. I zig over to there, I make a line to there, and see where it hits uh, this line. Okay, so that's the thing. But you can also go it the other way. Okay, works below, everything works with in, in, uh, negative uh, uh, values. So that's something to remember is a, a parabola, which we'll be talking about in more detail shortly, has a region that's on one side of one and another, a whole bunch of regions of, of different types of things on the outside of the parabola. So there's an inside and outside to a parabola. It's probably something you've not realized. Anyway, the below there to do the same thing, and then you uh, draw a, a line through the point that you got uh, by hitting the line. So that's the thing back there, and that leads to this point uh, here. So that's two points on a parabola gotten by of this construction. Okay? Well, here's a whole bunch of points that are gotten that way. And now I'm telling you the physics that we're interested in here, and I'm using the diagram that we showed um, in the last lecture uh, that uses similar triangles based on the ratio of the change of the potential over the change in x. That's this is the change in x. There's the uh, change in u that goes with it. That's a similar triangle to the uh, f of x and a constant. In this case, I've picked one half, so I'm doing one half x and one uh, right there in that particular triangle. So this is just a picture that we showed a movie of this thing actually moving up and down. Um, well, we had uh, several nonlinear potentials, and then we uh, picked the uh, harmonic potential at the very end of the lecture that uh, dealt with that, just to remind you where that was. Well. Uh, the couple of things uh, going on here that I want to point out, um, but I want to do it with a drawing. It's not quite so messy. But this one is interesting because the force, most people don't think about this, but the force, uh, when you draw it this way, is always the abscissa of the point. That's a unique thing. It's true of a, a parabola. Okay, and that's the linear force. That's the Hooke law force that we uh, approximate the sophomore physics Earth uh, with. Now, this is a more polar coordinate oriented uh, uh, way to view um, conic sections in general, but the parabola in particular. And um, 
what I bring up is the optical definition of a parabola as a reflector. Uh, this is a what kind of reflector for a searchlight, but a reflector in a telescope would just be the very bottom of this. Uh, in any case, um, I'd like to use this one because it covers the whole region and principle of the parabola uh, <clears throat> that we have on the graph here. So um, what I want to uh, point out um, using this uh, diagram right here that there are some old geometrical names uh, for various things, particularly the focus. That's the, uh, the point where uh, the, if you were to have it, uh, light coming in here, reflecting off the reflector, go down and, and hit here. This would be uh, a solar collector that was trying to heat something to a high degree of temperature pointing at the sun. So all the sun's rays are coming in. Every one of them uh, reflects at just the right angle uh, to enter and go through this point right down here. And then uh, presumably go back out and and also, uh, if, if it doesn't get absorbed, uh, uh, he dialed, uh, going vertically upward. Well, the basic idea is vertically incoming ray reflects into the focus. That's the way you define a focus of, of a parabolic reflector. But the, the thing that's cool about this is that there's a geometrical line called the directrix that's parallel to the focal plane, that's this Thing, uh, horizontal line going through the, the focus and the idea is that the distance to the focus from the reflection point is equal is a nice circular arc uh, to here which makes something that's, that looks like a kite and that's my favorite sort of my discovery of a way to handle parabolas in all kinds of sections but we'll just do the parabola today uh, that uh, uh, We'll talk about in just a minute. We can go ahead here, and get this thing up to speed here, and show you what it is that we're aiming at. Here is that structure uh, right there. That geometrical structure. Um, this is parabolic geometry carried to extremes. But there's a a, a radius. It's that's what we should really call this thing. I'm going to go ahead on this and explain why this is. I I, I think that politically incorrect to call it the lattice rectum. Uh, I, I, as I say here, the uh, old term lattice rectum is an exclusive copyright now of the extreme roid rage gym at Venice Beach, California. Uh, if you believe that. Okay. But anyway, uh, this is a radius, and it's a very important radius. It's a radius at the focal point. But it's also the distance the director is from that point. So there's always going to be a square here. So if you want to find out where the focus point is and for, uh, for a, a, a parabola, you just simply look at where the slope is 45 degrees, one to one. That will be true for every parabola. It will not be true for the other conic sections, but take advantage of what you get. So there, there is the beginning of this construction over here of this. And this is the construction that I'm going to have you using a problem to draw the inside of the Earth potential. Um, and it's, it's kind of neat because what it does is it finds the tangent immediately. All you have to do is finish a line uh, to the halfway point. You just have to you know, uh, draw the rest of the kite. The kite is this right here. It's very easy to find it. And basically what's happening is it's going to go through a point that actually tells you what the value of that lambda that lattice radius uh, is uh, for a particular uh, a parabola and uh, also uh, it's a, it, it, as you go up on the thing you always have the slope will actually be read off by where this indicate where this uh, crosses that axis. So it, it has a lot of uh, things that it tells you. And also you should realize that most people in calculus books have learned the parabola from the 4P, Y, x squared. Well, 4p, okay, it's 2p is la as lattice radius. And then 4p is twice that. Okay, and that's an interesting thing. That's the circle of curvature uh, that goes with this particular uh, thing. And this is really kind of neat because you can see the circle really kisses. It's a, as much kissing as it can do. Of course, it isn't really touching 
uh, anywhere except here, but it's really close. So the, that circle of curvature has the radius of lambda. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, that kind of sums up, I think, uh, everything. Now, the thing is, as I said, there's a big difference from being above the uh, focal and in below it. When you're below it, the kite that you make is, is, is less like the American kite and more like a Chinese or Oriental or Indonesian kite. The kinds that fly much better than these, but these will carry more weight. Anyway, it starts out being a square kite, and then it gets narrower and narrower as we take the points down in the lower regions of the parameter. But the, all, each of these, each of these creates a tangent. And a whole bunch of tangents is a much better way to make a curve. And this is what was discovered when they um, uh, did engraving, engraving, engraving to make a print of something in a textbook. The, the way to make a good curve was to draw as many tangents as you could, and they would make contact with the curve that you actually wanted. And then this becomes the contact transformation, which is the guts of classical mechanics. And the contact transformation is the guts of classical mechanics because it's the guts of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics has waves doing things, and the waves make a contact transformation with the next wave front. This is a lot to learn all at once, but this is what, what's going on here. Okay, we're going to be talking about all that on some detail before we get out of the review unit. All right. Okay, now let's see if there's anything else that I need to um, to bring up here. We've got some work to do here with units. This is the geometry uh, section uh, closes at this point, and we go on, and we're going to uh, look. I'm sorry, it has a little bit more to do. Here's, this is the homework I'm going to be giving you. I'm going to be asking you to use the zigzag instruction. This is a similar triangle uh, collection here. And the instructions, basically, step one, step two, zigging and zagging off of the x equal one line. So you pick a particular x and then you go closer to x equal one, or else you go out on this end here and work with um, uh, x's that are larger than one. But all of them do a zig and a zag, and it's basically step one, following the line from the origin through that particular point x, one minus one, and then intercept the line uh, that uh, uh, comes with the particular x that you're interested in. And so the x tells you where to do on this part, this minus one line here, you zig back uh, to that line, and you've got your uh, your, your first point for the uh, inside, I'm sorry, the outside Earth potential, 1 over x. That's what we're, we're plotting here. And then you want the force, it's going to be 1 over x squared. You just do it again. And that's what's being stated here. You follow the line here to make the 1 over x squared a point. So when you're done with all of this, and I'll go ahead on this one, uh, I want your homework uh, to show the um, outside of the Earth force and potential curves. And do it as much by hand as you can and use graph paper, uh, whatever. Um, it, it, it's, uh, uh, some of you just resort to the computer immediately. This is one case where I would ask you to do it by hand. This is tactile. And then basically get a feeling for what the potential energy is like, but also what the force is like to go outside of the Earth. And then inside the Earth, we're going to have a whole other structure involving the kites, then the contact transformation there uh, uh, given uh, to make the parabola that matches uh, right at the uh, radius of the Earth, which we'll take as one in the geometrical units. So this is just warning you, this problem is coming up on Wednesday. Um, get ready with your graph paper and all. Uh, just plain graph paper will work here. I'll give a piece of thing. I used to do it on the board here and spend a couple of days. I'm going to short circuit that. You're going to do all of the work. But basically, you're going to end up with a product that looks something like that. Okay? 
literally constructing uh, 20 or 30 points on the outside and maybe two, three, four, or five points on the inside, but using a contact, a tangent that isn't shown here very well, but uh, that's what we're, what we're after. Okay, now finally, the physics. That's what I want um, you to get a feeling for as well. So geometry goes uh, in the basement for a while. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, how big are these, these uh, things that we're uh, talking about here, these potentials, these forces. Uh, and how does it compare to do electro electrostatics? I won't talk about electromagnetism mag yet. That comes later. That we'll do it. 10. But uh, uh, this is electrostatics and charge. So the question then is, what is this 1 over 4 pi epsilon, this so-called permittivity of free space? What the heck does that mean? We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to have it be a constant that somebody's given us, and I'd like to know how big it is. Okay. So mantissa, what's the power? Okay. That is uh, obviously very important. Well, the numerical value to one figure, basically, is 9 times 10, 10 uh, 9, time, 9 billion, 9 billion, so that's very close to 10 to the 10th. So th this, is, this is enormous in the units that we use. That is, in the units of newtons times meters squared per square coulomb. So Newton square meter per square coulomb. Remember, you've got two coulombs are sitting right there. Okay? And then this, this guy right here is going to have uh, those units and they're going to counteract the R squared that's in the denominator, the meter squared now being the numerator. Okay? So the, these are units that are really uh, quite, quite mind-boggling when uh, uh, you think about this. Okay? You would say, well, it's just because uh, you're using uh, uh, the, this Coulomb unit. Uh, it's really uh, uh, why you're doing something that's so big that gives you such a big number. Why, why did you pick the Coulomb? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> are there very many Coulombs in your neighborhood? Uh, actually, there better not be, because we're going to see the energy points at one Coulomb. But anyway, the, this is the basic thing with all of the numbers going as such as we, we uh, uh, can measure. And we're getting better at measuring uh, the value of this. Now, when you ask how much charge does our favorite uh, um, chemical particle, <laughs> electrons, uh, how, how, how much? Well, it's, it's 10 to the, it, it's 1 billion billion, uh, roughly. Okay. The, the, the charge of that thing is really a tiny piece of a coulomb, 1.6 10 minus 19. But the unit that you use in magnetism and in most of the work you do in the laboratory, an ampere. Okay, you get an ampere instead of a little flashlight, right? That's a coulomb per second. One of these suckers is coming through every second with just a flashlight, right? I mean, just thinking about this is, is, is worth doing, right? Get some feeling for what world we're living in. Okay, it's, it's a bizarre world. All right? Now, of course, uh, plus plus, that's repulsive. You have the same charge coulombs. This thing wants to blow up. And that's why, if I had one coulomb in this room, it would be only a microsecond, we'd all be dead and then blow up Fayetteville. The coulombs is a monster. But yet, yeah, one coulomb per second going in my little flashlight. How do we square ourselves with that? That's a, quite a paradox of, of forces and units. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's go and look, and this is what's in the textbook, uh, what it is that's in a cubic centimeter. Okay, so your fingertip, take your fingertip and imagine how many coulombs of electrons are in there, but we also know there's protons in there, and they better be both there or your fingertip's going to blow a Fayetteville. So the basic idea is that uh, you have a molecular weight here of, of uh, 18. That's counting uh, 16 units. 
Now there's eight protons, but uh, there's some neutrons in there, and it's a pretty nice, stable thing, that oxygen. Okay, and it has some electrons uh, making the uh, hydrogen uh, stick to it and be H2O, but that's, you know, 18. It's a pretty small um, uh, molecular weight. CO2, it's got carbon uh, and uh, oxygen uh, twice. That's a lot more, and that's what's causing our problems for global warming. But in any case, um, this has a certain uh, set of coulombs in it, okay? 10 electrons and 10 protons uh, is what we're talking about here. And that is, if you add up all of this up, multiply the numbers out carefully, I'll check my arithmetic later, but I can tell you that in your fingertip, just for the electrons, we've got minus 50,000 uh, coulombs. And then the protons, you've got plus 50,000 coulombs. They better both be there. Okay. So if you're, you, you think about this, you figure, I, I might cancel my next manicure. I don't want to disturb those 50,000 coulombs. Ooh. Okay? But it's zero total charge, so we, 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 we kind of luck out there. Okay? Now, all that is said, all, this, all that said about the enormity of this constant, the one that we're going to be drawing graphs for is going to be, uh, this time anyway, uh, the sophomore physics Earth and that involves gravity. So the gravitational force between, uh, as opposed to the electrostatic force between um, coulombs, kilograms, we're going to compare the, the, the two. <clears throat> and uh, we're talking about a certain mass and we're going to measure the MKS units. That's cool kilograms, okay, that's okay. So, um, this is gravitational. All right, so the question is now, what's the 1 over 4 pi epsilon correspondence numerically? Okay, this is something times 10 to the something. And that, that's what we need uh, to definitely uh, make uh, our comparison with, okay? So, uh, that's uh, the answer, at least part of the answer. In fact, I've got the most precise uh, reading I can find right now in the tables. And we really don't know this one very well. That 80 means that this could be varying by you. So I could just put two zeros here and that'd be kosher. So we got about four figures on this one. That's really screwy. Okay, that, that's gonna change, I think. I mean, as we do, but if you're gonna do any quantum gravity, you better get more than four figures on your on your physics, <coughs> all right? In any case, um, what it comes out to be, instead of 10 to the 10th, is 10 to the minus 10th in these units. That's kind of neat. Did you, did you ever work this out? Is this something you're familiar with? Okay, 10 to the minus 10th. Well, it's, two, it's less than that. It's 2 thirds of 10 to the minus 10th. It's really small. Okay? So that's worth, right? now all of these, these things where I just have a couple of digits are off, I'm going to emphasize because that's the way you do physics in your head. This is something Feynman uh, uh, taught, taught me um, that uh, you should go around and try to use, if you have a poor memory, uh, the, you can remember a lot of things by looking carefully at them. Okay, so that's something that would be committed to memory uh, for our, our physics. Now, that's the force. Uh, we've got uh, that under the, the uh, electrostatic force, the electrostatic potential. Okay, let's go go to that, and then we'll take the gravity uh, stuff up a, a little bit uh, later on. Okay, but at this point, um, I want to um, emphasize that this goes as one over r, because it's one over r squared. Uh, signs can change, and um, this uh, little. 10 to the 10th means joules per square coulomb, okay? Uh, we're used to the MKS unit of energy there, uh, the um, <coughs> product of a uh, newton and a meter, that's a, the unit that's been given to a very famous physicist, and the idea is um, what uh, sort of potential energy is involved in things that are 
located just a, a distance r uh, from each other. So I'd like to compare atomic size, that's an angstrom, okay, 10 to the minus 10th uh, meters. That's a one-tenth of a nanometer. Okay, the nanometer now sits as the name of the building across the street here, the nano building, right? It's named after the nanometer. Okay, now if we ever get to work on smaller things, perhaps uh, it will be called the Ango building for angstrom, but right now it's the nano building, and that's where we we'll do most of our work in this uh, department on things that are uh, atomic size, uh, approaching atomic size, about uh, 10 times atomic size. Okay, But if you're going to do some nuclear physics, it's a lot smaller. One femtom, femtometer, femtometer, one fm, or one fm is capitalized. That's something I want to point out here. Anyway, a big molecule like my buckyball up there is somewhere on the order of seven angstroms. Ten angstroms is a pretty big, pretty big medium size, not biological, uh, rarely bigger, but um, it's a typical um, um, <coughs> organic chemical molecules. And um, we're talking about a nanometer almost there. Uh, here, we're talking about an FM, either capitalized, that's 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, when they did centimeter gram second CGS units, Fermi gets his name. This is capitalized because it's named after Fermi, not Mr. Femta. Now, these, uh, these uh, prefixes are up on the wall uh, there for a few of the 10 to the power things. So those are things you ought to know. And we haven't gotten to Atto yet. Femto is second to the bottom up there. Pico, and then Nano, then Micro, then Milli, okay, are all of the fractional uh, units, and then the inverses of those are uh, given above that. But this one, uh, you should be aware, uh, is named after Fermi if you capitalize it. Anyway, one Fermi is typical nuclear radius. Okay? So you're talking about something that's down by 100,000 in size compared to the orbits of the certain, now the orbits of the nuclear uh, waves are uh, that fraction, 100,000 typically, of the orbits of the, of the things that make chemistry. And these make nuclear chemistry and uh, they do it with a vengeance. Okay? The nuclear radii you see are 100,000, two a million times smaller than atomic chemical radii, you see. So, the nuclear energy is that many times, 100 to a million times larger than the typical chemical, and thinking explosives, when those things get loose and to, are going to be repelling to blow up, well, the chemical explosives can be fierce, they can blow up buildings, but these can blow up, well, the entire world. <laughs> so there's your you're really, this is what these units are, are telling you. This is where nuclear energy comes from. And it isn't calculated by the way that they always state it. They stated it's, that that's mc squared, but you don't know what m and c squared are, uh, then you, you know what the units are. You can figure out uh, uh, much more precisely how much you're getting from a typical fission of, a, of whatever it is, chemical or a nucleus. Okay, now, uh, the geometry of this uh, sophomore physics Earth we're going to go into, uh, we're going to talk about the curves uh, a little bit more now, and we're going to take some steps uh, down the potential to uh, deal with uh, this. The um, thing that we'll mostly be talking about is Earth matter, but I will mention the note here, because that it comes up and crush the, the Earth. Okay, but the first thing I want to go over very quickly, this would be a Gauss law uh, study here, but I'm doing it with geometry as usual um, for our introductions. Um, I'm imagining that I have a little point out here that I'm looking at, and I'm trying to ascertain what kind of gravitational force I would feel if I was inside a shell, just a shell of 
well, really dense metal or something that uh, normally I would feel attracted to if I was outside and I would fall into it. But inside, it's a whole different story inside. Inside, if it's a perfect sphere, you're weightless. Absolutely weightless because the similarity of these triangles here makes this area, uh, which is going up with the square of the distance, counter the uh, inverse square of the attraction. Uh, to this particular object here uh, at this particular crossing point, this point right here, you see. And this one has a shorter distance, but it's a smaller a bunch of uh, matter pulling on it. And so it can, this little matter can pull exactly as much force in this direction as this matter right here pulls uh, the other way. So imagine for a moment we really were on a shell. Uh, the Earth had somehow hollowed out to make a uh, shell, say, that thick or that thick or something like that. And uh, I had a manhole cover or womanhole cover, whatever, uh, that I could lift up, set aside so that I could look into the, the void there. And then I get brave and I decide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of lower myself uh, in there just to see what it feels like. And as I lower myself in there, my feet start getting weightless. And then finally I come up to here. I'm, I'm, I come right to here, say, I'm just below the inside of that shell, okay, I can let go and just float inside the shell, right? I better be careful though, if I just push a little bit, I take off, the, you know, with whatever velocity I gave myself, and I can't do anything. I can, oh no, I can't, throw me a rope, right? Okay, you know, the funny games you can play with your mind as you think about, you know, uh, the Earth being. Uh, of the structure, okay? But what it means is, you see, that when we go to uh, measure how much force you're going to feel in the real Earth, assuming it was homogeneous and the same density everywhere, that's not right, but that's why we call this stuff in our physics theory. But at a certain point, uh, I have a, a smaller radius than the radius of the Earth, and I'm dealing with only the matter that's inside there. I can't feel any of this matter outside. So all I feel is what's below me, the stuff above me, if it's perfectly spherical, according to this analysis, will not attract or repel me at all. So I can use that to build a formula uh, for what the potential and in, in force will be inside the Earth. So it, well, I would be feeling G times the matter less, my mass, the gravitational constant, that 2 thirds, 10 to the minus uh, 10, and uh, I have here the radius of this little uh, thing here that I have to square. But what I'll do is I'll just take that up and figure out what its volume is. So I'll put a 4 pi over 3 here and a 4 pi over 3 here. So I can use the volume formula. All right. And then I put those guys all together in the density. This is a nice density. This is the mass ratio with the, de the uh, volume. You see, mass per volume is the density of the Earth everywhere in the sophomore physics Earth. It's pretty close to uniform once you get below a certain point. The radius about that big. It's a lot of iron. But in any case, the um, idea then is that your formula will just be a, a function of R less. So that gives you Hooke's Law. It's mg times x. Okay, That's the a geometrical unit I would use. x equals 1 here and x equals 0 there in all these pictures that involve geometry. So that's something worth uh, knowing. It's a, a lot easier uh, to teach somebody in the first go-around uh, this way. Okay. So as you come back up to the Earth, this thing should give you the acceleration of 9.8 meters per second we're so used to as you come right up to the Earth uh, radius. Okay. So let's bring all this stuff up to this point. Just the just below formula is what, what I call this. Now, what are the actual numbers uh, for this, which you're seeing at the bottom of the screen there? Okay. Uh, Earth radius, Earth mass. The, the sun's pretty important around here. Uh, solar radius, solar mass. Okay. Well, those are the numbers that you get from the tables. But look, this one's pretty easy to remember. 6.4 times 10 to the 6. Two sixes, okay. 
That's, that's the Earth radius. Solar radius, 7 times 10 to the 8th. Okay, that's pretty close to 7, right? All right, these are all approximations that you can hold in your head. At least you, I could hold on my head before I got old and forgetful. But the uh, Earth mass here, okay, 5.97, that, that's pretty close to 6. All right, times 10 to the 24th. Okay, there are ways to remember. And 2 times 10 to the 30th here for the uh, solar mass, okay, kilograms. This is all MKS. And they're kind of nice numbers. All right, this is what you look for, right? If you want to uh, um, be at a, a, a physics meeting and, and like find and try to impress everybody. All right. Okay, now here's the thing that I'm asking you to actually construct using the kites to make a, um, a parabola up to a point, okay, up to that magic point where you're just opposite the focus and that's what you're going to uh, discover by uh, looking at uh, this thing that focus is right there, okay, when you're at the surface of the Earth, okay? And that's the, the point where the parabola meets and matches in slope the potential of the gravitational field outside the Earth. The force is very uh, contrary. It comes in having much less, that is, it gets close to the axis very quickly out there, so you don't feel much force if you go uh, to 10 Earth radii, but you can see a lot of potential that's going up anyway. So you come down with this thing and then it turns the corner right there. And this is really amazing. In other words, the question is, how did it do that? How does the force turn out? And that's where the sophomore physics Earth model really comes apart. Because uh, you, 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 as you, uh, if I lower myself uh, 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 downstairs, dig a hole, I'm not going to see that. That's not going to happen. Okay, but I will, with a precision gravitometer, notice something is going on as I, I go. But it won't just turn around and start back up again like this. That's definitely sophomore physics stuff right there. Okay, this discontinuity of the force is, is quite weird. Okay, but I'm just asking you to go ahead and do it on a piece of paper. That's not such a bad thing or misleading thing. And here again is the uh, geometry that I'm asking you. Uh, to look at uh, that width. Okay. Now, uh, the boring part of this lecture is the formulas that you get by doing this, and also the technique that I'm using to do this, where I'm using MKS variables, but we do a scaling relation right here by using the radius of the Earth. And that way, I can just write my potential as a number in minus 1 over x. That's what it would uh, be outside, okay, where x is the distance. So that will uh, give me this thing in geometrical units. So this is a little bit probably unfamiliar with you, but this is this scaling relation between the, um, the actual MKS uh, di distance, me meters, and the um, <coughs> radius of the Earth, which uh, we're going to uh, have be equal to uh, really one uh, right there. Um, with that said, uh, the formulas will all have MKS units, but you can connect them to uh, your geometry. So the KE equal PE relation, which is a, an interesting one here, the kinetic energy it takes to escape, if you're standing at the surface of the Earth, how much does it take? really get out of here, okay, I mean, get all the way to infinity. And so that's this number right here that um, is, uh, up, you know, quite high. That is, I got to jump up to here in the energy scale to get out of here. And then I'll be at very large distance going very slowly is a way to say that. If I go to infinity, I get zero velocity. And of course, it works the other way around. If I drop something from way out there, it's going to come in with this escape velocity. So we'd like to know what that is in meters. And so we eventually work that out here uh, using the units that I just showed you. So that, that works out to about 11 kilometers per second, about 7 miles uh, per second. 
that's a lot faster than most of the meteorites that you see zipping across this, the sky. Uh, you, every once in a while you'll see something go like that, and it's still not that fast. Very seldom do you get uh, to see something that fell from infinity. And that's a whole other thing. Now, the question about the uh, velocity that you would have if you went all the way to here, okay, the bottom potential, okay, that's the thing that the rest of this is working out here. Once you figure out what the bottom potential, of course, it's and all of this uh, right here is a parabola, so it's matching a, a quadratic uh, function for velocity. That's a very nice uh, a part of it. Okay, so that's inside the Earth. Outside the Earth, meanwhile, we've got uh, this kind of force and this kind of potential energy. These are things that make all this go. Now, for doing dynamics that we'll be doing later on, we need more than that. Um, and we're all also interested in how this potential would go if the Earth were crushed and it, it stopped here instead. Or crushed further, it would stop, you know, somewhere closer and so on. So that's what we really are at uh, in all of the formulas. I'm going to be flashing by you here uh, in, for a few minutes here. Now, the centrifugal force of a circular orbit Okay, perfectly circular orbit, okay, has a certain velocity that's a lot less than the state velocity. How much less? Well, that's what comes up here. And what you discover is quite remarkable, is this is a factor of two uh, that we're talking about in terms of the energy. Okay, that, that's kind of neat. In other words, uh, what, what this I want to show you is a three-step process to heaven. You start in hell, which is the center of the earth. Okay, you go up a certain number to be able to sit on the surface of the Earth. You go up the same amount to be orbiting uh, the Earth in a perfectly circular orbit from at radius. Okay, in other words, a, 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 a circular orbit on a sophomore physics Earth where you literally could orbit at one meter off the surface of the Earth. Uh, okay, and then the same amount of energy to get to heaven, which is then. Okay? So it's a three-step process that I've never seen. No textbook points this out. This is so cool. Okay? Three, three, three steps to heaven. Okay? Or three steps to hell if you're going the other way. And so uh, there's the kinetic energy that you have uh, in that orbit. Okay? That's all, these are all things that are easy to get. No calculus involved here. Just algebra. And that crazy stuff we talked about. Of, I'm making a shell with no force in it. Okay, so there's one, two, three uh, that we'll be talking about um, much more later on. And these are the uh, angular frequency. The frequency of the orbit is also an important thing. And of course, this applies to any spherical body uh, that uh, you can uh, think of with orbit speeds. Okay, now the orbit speed is 7.9 kilometers a second compared to uh, how fast you'd be going if you fell all the way to the center. And we're going to imagine something that could fall all the way to the center and keep going. And that would be what I call the neutron starlet. But we'll get to that in a minute. It would be so mad, so dense, that it would treat the Earth as some cotton candy. It wouldn't even uh, slow down as it went through us. So th these are sort of a summary of all these, these formulas I'm talking about here. Okay? And orbit period. This is a very important number. 84 minutes is uh, how long it takes to do that uh, clock tree skimming uh, orbit. Uh, most of our satellites are much higher than that. The space station is much higher. The, sta the space station is 90 minutes. So they're not skimming the trees, right? So uh, that, that's the number that you would have for them. Now as you, as you make the Earth denser, this, uh, this parabola, okay, if you make the Earth that big by crushing it somehow, uh, the parabola gets much deeper, and uh, there's a big, big jump right there that we uh, went from the surface of the original Earth, okay, but still, this maintains its 1 over r now, and I don't get to use the parabola until I get to that radius, and then I get to use this parabola. Okay, now how many times is that? Well, this is where you just rescale those formulas. 
imagine reducing r to r over 2. Well, uh, I'm going to change the formulas by just one half of, of the radius that I have there. So we find that for the surface gravity goes up quadratically. So there's four times the surface gravity. But there's only square root of two times the surface escape speed. Two times potential, and that's what makes the square root of two. Okay. And square root of two times orbit speed, they're both radicals. So these are all things that are worth you know, thinking about making uh, a story about uh, this uh, business of crushing the Earth. Okay. Well, let's look at the densities and how they come out in numbers. The Earth mass, with its 10 to the 24th kilogram, I'm going to call 624 now, I'm going to start rounding and using smaller numbers, but I'll keep the big numbers uh, for some of this. Uh, the Earth volume here, I've got our cube here, so we're talking about, about 10 to the 18th, that's about 10 to the 21st cubic meters uh, that we're talking about uh, for Earth volume. If it's a sophomore physics Earth, this is just the arithmetic uh, to get uh, the, to that point, okay, and the density that you get by dividing the volume uh, here uh, with this mass that we were talking about, okay, <coughs> is it a density of 6 times 10 to the third kilograms. Well, how can you think about that? Uh, what is it that has a density about that? Well, a density of solid iron that you would just buy at the local iron store is about 8 times 8,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now, cubic meter cut of, of a solid metal, that, that's a lot of stuff. So I can imagine having, uh, um, you know, 8,000 kilograms. Uh, <clears throat> 16,000 pounds, okay? Now the density of liquid is only 6.9. The liquid is, is uh, pretty fluffy compared to the solid. And that is getting much closer to this. You see, so the, the iron in there is, is, is pretty fluffy by about 10, 20 percent. Okay, so that is, I think, important. Now, what about uh, nuclear matter. What if it, what if it instead uh, we're talking about a planet or a star or something, a neutron star uh, that has a nuclear? Uh, in other words, you take a nuclear mass mass for this. Okay, and say the nucleus of atomic weight 50 has a radius of three femtometers. We talked about nuclear radius, so we're just picking this out so we get an even number. Is really what's going on here? So 50 uh, nuclei. Uh, sorry, Carol. Uh, 50 uh, nuclei, each with a mass of 10 to the 27, which is what we, we get, okay, with that. And you pack those into a volume. Uh, I'm talking a, a, a finger nail here. How much does just that much of the nuclear uh, matter? It would have a trillion kilograms in a finger nail. So, whew, the neutron stars, they are really, really dense. And um, that is really something to think about. Now, how big would the Earth be if it were reduced to nuclear matter? And we just had a football game, and we didn't have that many people this time, but they did pretty well anyway. Uh, this is the size of the Earth if it was reduced to nuclear matter. So there's the nuclear Earth, okay? Crush the whole damn thing to the size of uh, Razorback's uh, stadium. Yeah, that's that's kind of kind of neat. So we bring it down to 300 meters, all right? Third, third of a kilometer, okay? All right, well, we're not done here. What happens if you go even further, okay? Now, I'm first going to introduce the nuclear, nuclear the, the neutron star one. Okay, he's only one cubic centimeter. He weighs a lot. Okay, he's got 10 or 12 kilograms. And I'm going to imagine the trajectories. I'm going to imagine the sophomore Earth are of this guy. Now you say, well, could that be? Could there be a, a piece of nuclear matter that would be stable? Uh, not, but could it be orbiting in the Earth? Okay, and how long would it last? That orbit, you see. Eventually, it would damp out because there's friction, but not much compared 
to that density. That thing lasts for years in an orbit without even changing at all. It doesn't even see the Earth. The Earth is just fluff compared to what it's got. Okay? So we're going to imagine problems of a nuclear, a nu nuclear star, starlet, a neutron starlet orbiting in the Earth. And then uh, the next fantasy here is black hole. So let's suppose it's crashed, because this is something Newton even figured out, to, 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 so that the surface escape velocity is the speed of light. Just put that in as a thing. Now we have a formula for escape velocity, okay, uh, right there, just by using uh, the formulas that we've already developed. Okay, so what we do is we uh, work that out. We first of all have the velocity c is escape velocity, okay, and then we put in those values uh, for that, okay, and what you discover is that in order to uh, crush the Earth uh, to uh, a, um, a black hole radius, the, the singularity of the radius, uh, it has to be crushed to this big, your fingertip. The entire Earth in my fingertip. That would be just the threshold of building a black hole. Then light can't get out. So it'd be a little black spot here. It's a huge force. Okay? Crazy. But that's what you'd like to do in physics. Physics is crazy. Absolutely nuts. And it's fun because of that. Okay. Now we have just about 10 minutes here to talk a little bit about the dynamics of the neutron star. It's cruising through a gravitational mass that is attracting it, allowing it to orbit like any particle uh, that was, say, in a tunnel. Suppose we build a tunnel all the way through it. Again, uh, total fancy. You never make it. And all kinds of stuff's going on down there. Uh, so anything you tried to build down there would be destroyed immediately, on heated, uh, oil, burned. So, you know, you, you see what I'm doing. This is all the kind of fantasy that I'm playing with units. So we got this linear force. Now, in our geometrical units, that force is minus the distance. That's the force law in there. You have a radius that's also a force vector. That's what you get for using geometrical units. That makes it easier to think about. Right? So I imagine that maybe I have a force right here. I put it right there with the same radius as that. And I let the two of them go, okay? They're going to track each other perfectly. Just as the thing that you always learn in, in uh, uh, sophomore physics, that if I shoot the gun, plunk, okay, and drop the bullet, they track each other, right? Well, this is a little more sophisticated version of that. These two are going to meet, if one was starting here and another one there, this is a harmonic oscillator inside here, and so everything's going to have the same frequency. These things are going to track each other as they go. We can just do this. If I drop it from here, okay, and there's another a particle here, and it's orbiting, okay, it's going to track me falling. So this will happen. I'll go here and it'll always be above me, always above me, always above me, always above me. The force this way projects perfectly on this one. So this one could be in an orbit and it would track me as I fell. Harmonic oscillator, really simple a way to keep track of, of um, the motion. So we're going to be seeing elliptical orbits of all types in this neutron starlet fantasy. But before we do that, we have to really show that when you have a potential that is x squared, that it gives you harmonic motion. Now, we've already kind of done this already, but I point out again, this is stuff you're going to be teaching 
here's a sneaky way to get all of that stuff just in a small space here. Uh, and here and here and here and here and here. Let me get all these formulas up to date on this one because this is an important point. I want to make sure that you um, see it. So we're going to be talking about uh, this kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Both of them squares. That's supersymmetry when the velocity of the momentum is squared and the position is squared and I get rid of all of these uh, constants here by just scaling. I'm going to have p squared plus x squared, or p squared plus q squared. This q is the q is on the board over there because there's a curve of linear coordinates, which we'll be getting to quick enough. But uh, for now, just things we're used to, uh, these quantities, okay? This mv squared, okay, that we have uh, writing here, mv squared over 2e using our expressions for the total energy, which is this, okay? And then I've got something squared plus something squared equals 1. I've just scaled this thing so that I get 1. That could be cosine squared and sine squared, right? And that's where we go. That's where we get the position behaving, uh, say, like a sine with that coefficient, and then the velocity behaving uh, with a cosine with that. So you get the entire motion plus the angular velocity and all that. So this is the uh, little bit of calculus now just to round it out so that you can use the uh, quantities that involve angles and their derivatives with, res uh, with respect to time or with uh, inverse x. So all of this um, is um, a really quick way to see that that's what we're going to get. We're going to be getting elliptical orbits, and they're going to be harmonic, and they're all going to have the same frequency. And it's going to be k over m, so it's, it's kind of hook's law uh, played in a big uh, theater, right? So th th this is just to remind you why all this works, the tracking uh, that's going on here. The f force is always the radius in our units, geometrical units. So the force here is this big, but this one is going to be cosine of whatever that angle is at any moment. So it's going to go to zero, but this force is going to rotate its component on the x. It's got to match, and so does the motion. Well, that's, that's uh, kind of neat. So uh, if you were to have a parallel track, they got to match each other if you were making subways. Okay. So I'm going to be giving you a lot of problems with subways in the Earth. That's a, they're kind of neat. And as I say, 84 minutes is the time uh, for this kind of stuff because we, we're matching a treetop orbit, surface of the Earth uh, radius orbit, uh, in all of these uh, things here. So uh, what that means is that uh, this would be true even, even if the track length okay, was one meter or even if it was a twelfth of a micron, okay? Um, if, if I, uh, you know, built a track that's just really, really f a flat track, I just put in this room a really flat thing, and I'm real careful about getting it absolutely level, okay? And then the question would be, and then I have it uh, frictionless, I have uh, my favorite superconductor uh, floating my uh, little magnet, okay, and I put the magnet down in the center of my absolute level thing, it won't move. But if I take it out here to say uh, half a meter or so, how long does it move? Yes, it has to. How long does it take to get to here or say the other end? It'll be an oscillator, right? And it's going to be tracking an orbit that's you know how fast that is? It's 42 minutes, another 42 minutes, right? So it takes 42 minutes to go from one side to the other. Isn't that cool? That's an experiment we can actually do in this room. We haven't uh, got all the superconductor stuff working. Air track's not good enough, too much noise. So that did not uh, succeed. Anyway, 
uh, just to get a little bit a uh, head start, what's coming next uh, is that we're going to track orbits with phasers. This is a quantum mechanical tool. It's a wave mechanical tool, but this is an oscillator, so this is the very simplest uh, thing. Now, this real way that you that I'm advertising is such a good way to think about quantum mechanics and classical mechanics together um, is starting here. And uh, we're dealing with something that would normally be assigned um, to a complex variable. That is, you would have a position, and then you'd have a, uh, that would be the real part, and then something on this axis would be the imaginary part. If it is going to be a circle, this has to be the velocity divided by the frequency. So if you take a unit frequency, then this is just velocity. But it's a phase space in the sense that it's position versus a momentum. So uh, integrals in this thing are called action. The area in here is called an action. That's part of quantum mechanics. But right now we're just doing classical mechanics of our neutron starlet fantasy. And we're looking at a couple of ways to view the uh, elliptical orbit that results from having the velocity uh, be the x the, the ordinate axis, the y-axis, and the x-axis being the x-axis. That's for the x component of this thing. But in general, you'll have the y component. This is a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. This is U2 symmetry. So we've got to have this extra hardware, mathematical hardware here. So in any case, this is a phaser that has been turned on the side. So the y position is tracking the y motion over here. And then the velocity of the y is the uh, imaginary part of the phaser if you were using complex numbers, which we will soon enough be doing in chapter 10. But right now, we're just using it as a geometrical ruse in order to produce an orbit it's elliptical. And it can be either right-handed or it can be left-handed. Now this is a really important tool if you're doing anything with polarimetry. That is, the study of polarization of light. And that is getting to be a more and more powerful way to look at things for many uh, types of spectroscopy. So um, being aware that um, that's in the in the cards here. Uh, you're learning about the um, mathematics of U2, which is all the stuff in the corner of this uh, uh, um, wall of formulas. Uh, and basically those formulas are just doing stuff with spinners that make this. Spin is really just a two-dimensional oscillator. That's all it is. The, everybody gets all focused on that phallic vector. The hell with that. It's this is the structure. This is what makes it tick. This is the heartbeat of a, of spin, electron spin. It's also a photon spin. And that's what this is. And that was discovered before electron spin. And we're going to be making that point uh, later on. So this is pretty much uh, the end of this particular thing. There's lots of stuff here to study if you want to get a hit on this. Uh, but you can just go uh, to chapter 12 and see some of this. this. But it really doesn't get going until in unit 4, where we do resonance and oscillation uh, effects that are connected to it. Anyway, this is sort of giving you an idea what happens when we have some heavy formulas in this thing. We go real fast, because it doesn't help much for me to spoon feed you the details of working the formulas out. You go back and there's plenty of material in the text or in this lecture to help you uh, get familiar with those and get those things uh, cemented. When we have an exam, it will uh, have to be in this room. We're going to have to work out something. Some of the, some students uh, de demand extra time uh, for uh, things. If the university approves that, uh, we find a quiet place. So. What I'm going to be doing uh, with, if we do have exams, is finding out some way to handle that situation. I haven't figured it out yet. But um, we'll uh, maybe just, I was really impressed that most of the homeworks are getting close to 100%. If that keeps up, we don't need an exam. 
Okay? So I want you working hard. I want you, work I want you to get good, good homework. Because that's where you learn, right? Yeah. Okay? Uh, so um, we may solve this problem now. Okay, well, we'll be seeing you on Wednesday when we take up this uh, in a little more detail. Thank <laughs> you.